Hey, what's up everybody? This is your boy Kenny, and this is Triangle Season 3, Episode 24, and the name of this episode is, um, Anaga Pieces. And, let's just say, th they gave the right title to this episode, and I must say, I am still blown away by that ending. Man, Triangle Family, you delivered a great episode with this one, because I am still, like... <laughs> like my, my my mouth is still dropped to the my 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 jaw is still dropped after seeing what went down, but um what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to group it as best as I can because I don't want to I don't want to make this a long um, review, but before I get started again um let me give a shout out to um, brtbtv.com I will have the link in the description box but yes yeah, subscribe 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 to brtbtv.com as well as the Triangle Fan Club on Facebook because you get everything Triangle throughout the Triangle Fan Club and there's always constant discussions and theories, you know, being presented throughout the Triangle Fan Club. So, subscribe to BRTBTV.com and subscribe to the Triangle Fan Club on Facebook. You know, you get everything Triangle there, so. But man, I can actually say Anaga Pieces was the best thing to name this show because you literally saw people falling out of friendships and falling out of love throughout the entire episode. Alright, so let me get started. The first thing I'm going to talk about, the first case I'm going to talk about is the case involving, you know, Mason, Kiko, and Melanie and Joel. Alright, when, when we first see them, um, Melanie and Kiko are talking. She now, um, keep, uh, Melanie knows that she's pregnant and she tells Kiko and she doesn't want Joel to know about it and she's already decided that she's not keeping the baby. And and pretty much um, when she tells him, don't tell anybody, Jarrell walks in. And then later on, they're joined by Mason, who was actually in, you know, who, who, was, um, who had just came back from D.C. And, of course, Kiko had her fun with him, calling him, oh, you up in D.C. in a romper with your shapely body. <laughs> Kiko had me rolling, like, Kiko was doing a thing. But, um... In this scene, they actually talk about, um, Jarrell and Kiko pretty much tell Mason about the intervention they had on Brandon, and about how everything went left, and how he started coming for Jarrell, and how he was coming for Kiko, and this brings about, um, Kiko saying that, okay, yeah, he also brought up something else that I think me and you need to talk about, so, um, pretty much, she excuses, um, Jarrell and Melanie so she can talk to Mason alone and Wada and pretty much she pretty much asks um she asks like you know now I want the truth you know woman the woman slim to big is my aunt Ronnie still alive and he actually says yes and that he's known for a whole year which and then he also mentions JJ that JJ was actually um that, that uh, Ronnie had J.J. and she was holding him for Victor, but now J.J.'s missing, and they, and they don't know what's going on. So this immediately upsets Kiko because she's like, first of all, that's my aunt. If anything, why didn't you let me know about this? You mean to tell me you knew a whole year and you didn't tell me, but you told Brandon, but didn't tell me? So, of course, that made Kiko feel some kind of way, and she pretty much says that, look, our friendship is over. If you see me on the other side of the street, don't even look in my direction. I'm done. Next, we get a scene. Um, Mason so happens... Uh, so, it so happens that uh, Mason finds um, a used pregnancy test in the trash can and the test is um, positive. So immediately, he's like, who the hell up in here is pregnant? You know, I know Kiko can't get pregnant, so who the hell is pregnant? Melanie finally admits that she's pregnant and that it's Jarrell's baby, and Jarrell's standing right there. So this has already caused some tension. And she pretty much says that, look, you don't need to worry about it because I already decided I'm not keeping the baby. I'm getting an abortion and that's that. You know, I'm not losing my career. But this really upsets Jarrell because Jarrell is seeing that there's a light growing in her and he he wants to keep the baby. He, he thinks that she should have it. 
And it gets to a point where him and Mason get into it because Mason's like, look, it's her decision. This is the best decision she can make. She has a career in her life ahead of her. Right now, neither one of you are ready for a kid. You guys are not even together. You're not even in a relationship. But Jarrell doesn't care because he says that, look, I already lost one kid. I'm not going to lose another. So obviously, he had a previous relationship where the woman got pregnant by him and she aborted the child and he doesn't want to lose another kid. So Jarrell is all passionate about keeping the baby, but then Mason has to let him know, like, uh, you live with your brother Jabril, and you work for me. Um, you're not making that much money. You're, you're pretty much breaking even to support yourself. So how are you going to support a child? And let alone support a child with a woman that's not even your girlfriend or your wife. Now, this is a scene that really took me somewhere. Um, we actually see that uh, Sean actually goes back to see Neil again. Neil um, put in a request for his services. So, immediately, you know, we see that Neil has been drinking. And we saw him early on, but I'm going to touch on it um, when I talk about Brandon, Jabril, and um, Derek. Because um, we actually had a scene where he actually ran into Derek as well, but I'm going to talk about that later. But in this scene, this is after he had met with Derek. He's still drinking. He's fucked up on some Hennessy. And Sean comes through and, you know, he is just being real disrespectful and talking out the side of his neck to Sean and shit. Sean is like, look, you know, you know, um, you called me here, you know, so if anything... If, if you're not really serious about this, I can leave, you know, because I don't want to waste my time nor waste yours. And then Neil immediately starts getting overly aggressive. And is like, man, shut the fuck up. I'm running shit around here. You know, get naked and shit. So um, Sean strips and is about to give him head. And he was like, nigga, I ain't say I want no damn head. I want some ass. So next thing you know, we see he, um, these asses for a damn condom. I'm like, nigga. You mean to tell me you asking for some ass and you don't even have no condoms around you? And then Sean was like, ain't you supposed to have all this shit? And next thing you know, we see Neil begins to fuck Sean without no lube, with a rubber, and I can imagine, I mean, yeah, from the look of it, it looks sexy as shit, but I can imagine Sean was really feeling violated because he was not getting any pleasure out of it. Neil was getting pleasure that he was fucking some ass, but Sean was feeling nothing but pain because he was fucking him dry. And it gets to the point that after, you know, Neil busts his nut, you know, Sean, like, literally, you know, <laughs> he literally pushes the fuck out of him because he's like, he kept, because he kept trying to stop him during the, during, you know, during the sex act, but Neil was overpowering him. So, it was somewhat like equivalent of like a of like a rape, but then again, it's the business that he's in, so it is what it is. Sometimes the sex can be good, and sometimes the sex can be brutal. But at the end of the day, if you're getting paid, you got to take it. So Neil pretty much gives him some money, but doesn't give him a tip. You know, he doesn't give him the that he actually gave him money more. He actually gave him more money the last time than he did the t that did he did this time when he actually had sex with him. So Neil feels violated and he feels cheated, and we let, we literally see that Neil is really starting to see the dark side of being an escort. Then we um, we see that um, Kiko and Melanie have a conversation. Um, you know, pretty much Melanie is dead set that she's not ready to have a kid, and she doesn't want to. Well, actually, at first she. Um, we actually see that, that Jarrell finally comes over to talk to Melanie. They pretty much go back and forth. And she lets him know, let it be known, like, look, it's my body. I'm the one that's going to have to carry this kid, and I don't want to carry a child. I'm not ready to be a mother right now. This is not in the cards for me, and I'm not going through with it. And then Jarrell was like, look, come on, man. Like, how are you going to do that? You know, that's a life. He's like, no, right now it's a fetus. It's not a life, and it's my body. And we're not together. We're not married. If I'm going to have children, I want to be married with a husband. So Jarrell was like, well, let's get married then. She's like, fool, please, stop. Like, no. Won't you find you another girl to have a baby? That's what you really want to do. But it's not going to be me. So at the end of the day, I'm, it is what it is. And Jarrell is actually upset about it. But at the end of the day, she's made up her mind. 
then we actually see that she talks to Kiko, and it, it's funny because, like, Melanie goes off on Kiko. Like, she was just going in like, look, I'm getting sick of everybody trying to tell me what to do with my motherfucking body and how am I supposed to live my motherfucking life. At the end of the damn day, I don't give a fuck what nobody else has to say. You're supposed to be my friend. You're supposed to be on my team. You're supposed to have my motherfucking back. So which side are you on? Bitch, let me know. And then Kiko's like, girl, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm just saying, you know... You, you know, I was just saying in, in regards to that, you know, I was just kind of like giving you the fact that, look, Jarrell may see things differently, but I, but, I'm, but I support you. You know, if this is what you want to do, if you want to have an abortion, I'm, I'm all behind you. I got you. You know, I got you, I got you down, even though me and, your, me, and, me, and that, me and that brother of yours ain't friends no more, we still cool, so I got you. So I thought that was pretty cool. Then we actually see that Sean goes to see Kiko. You know, Sean can't act. Sean wants to come out and let Kiko know that he's escorting, but a part of him, you know, as far as his, far as, as far as his pride, won't allow him to openly admit that to her. But then we see that it's raining outside, and you know, Kiko is getting all close to him. She's like, "Oh, I'm scared," and she starts trying to make moves on him, and then Sean just flips the fuck out. He's like, "Damn, is everybody all about sex? Is everything always about sex?" I mean, fuck, I just want to come over and talk to you just like the last time. I just want to come over and talk to you, and then you start throwing yourself on to me, and then all of a sudden we had sex, and then you started tripping. Like, no, I ain't with this shit. He's like, you know what, I don't give you time for this shit. I'm getting the fuck up. I'm, I'm gone. And then Kiko's like, where are you going? You have nowhere else to go. <laughs> so we see that Kiko still cares about Sean, and Sean still cares about Kiko, and he was just coming there to really ease his mind because... We just saw what he went through with Neil. I mean, he feels very violated. He feels like a piece. He he literally feels like a piece of ass. Like he literally feels low, you know. And he's there trying to get solace and trying to be at a place that's familiar to him to get past what just happened to him. But then Kiko kind of like puts moves on him, which kind of like sets him off. But then again, Sean, now you realize that hey. You know, there's a dark side to to um, living that lifestyle, and now Sean is starting to experience it. And I have to admit, I, I really did feel for Sean in that scene because Sean literally felt like, you know, you 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 literally, it literally, I literally like damn near shed. I wanted to cry when I saw Sean in a way because it was just like, man, it's just like he literally felt like he literally like took his manhood from him, like he just roughed him up and. Afterwards, it was, it was just like he was still treating them like shit. I mean, that was crazy. But at the end of the day, he had to keep that straight face because it was about the money. But yet, he received such bad treatment for a little bit of money. And it's it's crazy, you know. And this this actually goes on, and that's that's the reality of it all. Now, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is Ashton and Winston. You know, that whole scene involving involving Ashton and Winston along with um, you know, new uh new comrades, Fallon and Clint. Now, Ashton and Winston are staying in this, you know, property that Fallon and um Winston actually, you know, do business out of and they also bring clients there too. Now I'm thinking, okay, you're there with Ashton. What makes you think that Dallin ain't going to show up? Because we know any piece of property or anything Dallin owns, Dallin is all up in it. So you should have kind of thought, Winston, that Dallin was going to show up and was going to make a scene. But we actually see that the two of them are connecting, and we see that Ashton is, at, is like, he's, he... He um he's feeling at peace with Winston, but Winston hasn't fully told him the full truth as to what happened to him. Um, you know, right now he's put it out there that Clint was the one who drugged him, but he doesn't know what happened after that in the role that Winston played. And once and Winston is not trying to tell that he's trying to live in the moment because he's so happy to have Ashton back in his life. So. They pretty much get it in. They making love in the bed. They are just in love's bliss. And then Fallon walks in. Fallon pretty much flips out. It's like, oh my God, you told me he was dead. What the hell is he doing here? Oh, what the hell? 
And then next thing you know, she's saying, "Oh, shut up, you little faggot." I mean, she was just going in on Winston, on um, on Ashton. And Winston, so Winston pretty much pulls down the side. They have a conversation, and and she's like, "Look." You told me that his ass was dead, and then I walk in, and you up in there, and you up in bed with him? Like, what the hell am I supposed to think? What is this shit? Like, you already know the kind of hell this person put me through, and yet, you're still in love with him. You're still trying to, you know, you're still trying to build something with him, knowing all that, all that I've been through dealing with him and Clinton and all of that. And he's saying that, look, it's not about you. I'm in love with him. You know? It is what it is. This is the this is the man I love. And it was so funny because Ashton came in there and he was like, Look, I really don't remember much of everything, but Clint did tell me about you and I can see what he says. You a bitch. <laughs> I was cracking up. I was like, Oh she's like, Oh, shut the hell up, faggot. You don't know what the hell you talking about. You don't even remember where you are. You don't remember anything. So she was just being real messy and shit. But Winston was dead serious that he was not going to give he that he found Ashton and he was not going to let him go again. So next we see that Fallon meets with the one person we never thought she would actually meet up with, and that is Clint. She brings Clint in and she lets Clint know about um, oh yeah uh, I think um, I may have something that may interest you and I need you to do something for me. But of course. Clint's like, look, you already know how I go, so what you paying, bitch, because I ain't doing shit for free. But then she lets him know that she walked in here and caught Winston and Ashton in bed together. And, of course, it made Clint feel some kind of way because you know how he feels about Ashton. And she's like, oh, what's the matter, girl? Did I hit a nerve? I'm like, Dallas, stop! <laughs> and she's like, oh, you feel some kind of way. Well, I'm just letting you know. Um, I caught them in bed together, but... um. I think what you need to do is you need to confront them and tell them the truth as to what happened. Because Ashton doesn't remember anything. Clint really doesn't know, really doesn't know, really doesn't know, like, how is it that, you know, Clint, after, after Winston handled it, he doesn't know how Ashton is still alive. So they're both kind of, like, puzzled as to what happened. So the only person that's holding all the cards is Clint. So they decide to bring it to Clint. So, soon as Winston walks in, him and Clint immediately go at it, and Clint had me laughing like shit because Clint was going on. It's like, oh, what's up? What's up? He's like, oh, what's up, Winston? Was you just come from church? How was church service? You enjoy Bible study? <laughs> I was like, you are stupid. <laughs> I was so laughing at that shit. He was just so going on. It was like, I'm like, come down, church boy. What's the matter? You know? You know, tag out your tongue, and then all of a sudden, um, Ashton comes in, and Fallon is there, and Fallon's like, look, we need to get to the bottom of this. Look, I brought Clint in because I know Clint is the only one that can get to the bottom of this. You know, Ashton, not knowing not knowing anything, you, on the other hand, not really knowing, like, how, how was it that Ashton was still alive? Like, we need answers. We, like, there's too many holes in this story. We need to get the full picture. So, Clint decided to tell the truth. He's like, yeah, I drugged you. But then again, Winston, did you tell him what you did? You know, while you was up there loving up on Ashton, did you tell him what you did? Did you tell him how you pretty much wrapped him up in, in some plastic and then buried him six feet under and left him for dead? And immediately we saw... Ashton was getting emotional, and I have to say, shout out to Ryan Cross, you delivered in that scene, because he flipped out once he realized that Winston buried him alive and left him for dead, but then Winston was like, look, I did what I had to do, I thought you were dead, and he said that the, the thing that he injected him with slows down the heart rate, so he's like, yeah, when I touched you, you had no heart rate, you had no pulse, I literally thought you were dead, and what I did, I'm a fixer, I handled it. I pretty much buried the body and decided to rid of, rid of the whole situation. So he's like, oh, so I was just uh, I was just something for you to fix? You didn't care about me enough to, to make sure I went to a hospital or anything? And then Clint was like, yeah, but that's what I did. I resurrected your ass from the dead. I was the one who got you a doctor and got you help. 
So that shit blows off, and Ashton runs off, and then, you know, Clint's like, ain't you gonna go and ask him? Yeah, why don't you go over there, go over there, get your heat, bitch. I was like, Clint is crazy. And then, it, it got funny because, like, Clint and Fallon literally had, like, a little kiki moment. It's like they both were happy that they was doing evil and that they done broke these two up. You know, and Naga Pieces already happening. Down, you know, Winston and, um, and Ashton are now broken up, falling out of love. And they both are happy about it, but then he lets it be known that, look, um, I want my money. And she's like, oh, I'll wire it to you. you you'll get your money. And she's like, oh, yeah, and I know your clothes are still the same. He's like, yeah, baby, you know me. And then all of a sudden he lets them know that, look, I'll let him live for now. But I'm going to kill that motherfucker, you know, soon enough. Talking about Winston. And <laughs> Fallon was like, I will kill you first before I let you kill Winston. You are not going to lay a finger on Winston. And, of course, in Clint's signature style, he gives her that threat. Don't underestimate me, wife. You really don't know what I'm capable of, honey. And um, I want that money. And it walks off. So it's like, they had a key key moment, and then Clint had to fuck her up. Then, then Clint had to, like... You know, throw some shade in, like, let her know, like, bitch, um, I got your number, and if you don't play your cards right, you'll get fucked up in this situation, because at the end of the day, now he got Fallon's card, he can use that shit against her, too, because Clint is pretty much like the Machiavellian, you know, you know, um, he's like the Machiavellian boogeyman of the show, so he's always playing mind games, and he always has a strategy for everything. So him working with Fallon could actually be to her disadvantage. So that's what I'm going to say about that. Now, the episode opens up with Brandon praying, and I have to give a shout out to Dominique Smith. Boy, you delivered in this scene because he poured out his heart. He was emotional, and he was just asking God to help him because he knows he needs help, and he can't continue to go on the way he's been going on and that he's so hurt of what he's done to Jabril because he still thinks that he cheated on Jabril with, with, with Alex and because of the drugs he's lost his way. And we actually see that he also has a conversation with his mother's spirit and his mother's spirit is letting him know like look I never left you I will never leave you but you need to you know deal with your pain so you can continue to live your life. I don't want you to no longer be burdened by your past and be burdened by your losses but you have to see your strengths and you really have to, you know, enhance them so you can continue to move forward with your life. And then he goes to hug his mother and then when he realizes that she's no longer, that she's not there, that it was she, that she was there in spirit and in mind and in, and in truth, he breaks down. Because we really see that, you know, the heart of it is him losing his mother. She was a really big component in his life and to lose someone like that to cancer, I mean, can't imagine, you know, the the depths of of um of pain and frustration that he's going through. But um then we get a scene with um Brandon and Jabril. Um and Brandon finally lets Jabril know that he apologizes for what happened and that he wants to get help and for and for Jabril to not to leave him. And Jabril agrees, but we can see that Jabril has no emotion. It's like Jabril gives no fucks anymore. It's like he's so fucking mad and he feels so betrayed. It's like even when Brandon went to kiss him, Jabril did not move an inch. It's like Jabril has completely shut off to Brandon. And it's actually sad because in all actuality, you know, we all know that Brandon really didn't sleep with Alex. Then we get a scene where I said I was going to go back to um, Neil and Derek. Um, Derek goes over to visit Neil because Neil's been blowing up his phone. Neil's been drinking and he's being very forceful and trying to, you know, get Derek to have sex or whatever. And Derek is like backing up like, yo, you are doing too much drinking and I really think you need to see somebody because you're, you're just not right right now. All this energy you're bringing, I'm not feeling that. And then Neil had a nerve to start flipping out like, man, well, fuck, well, fuck you then. Get the hell out of here with your ugly ass. Get the fuck out. I was like, damn. You, like, you just flipping out like shit. It's like he's becoming more and more irrational and more and more out of, you know, pretty much more and more out of control. Because, one, I think he needs to med, he needs to med calibrate it with his bipolar ass. And on top of it, he's drinking, and it's just making shit worse. And then... Derek pretty much looked at him and was like, you need to get help, and walked out. 
So Derek ain't with it no more, but then we already know that Neil's not going to let it go. Next, we get a scene with Christian and Jabril. Jabril is kind of dancing around that, that, you know, something's bothering him, but he doesn't really come out and tell, tell Christian what he's really going through. He's just saying that, you know, things that I thought, you know, are not true, and now I'm just trying to process everything, and it is what it is. And then we see that Jabril is trying to come on to Christian. And, and Christian, to my surprise, rejected it. He was like, boundaries. And I respect boundaries. You know, no. Because he's like, even though we all know that Christian is in love with Jabril, he's not going to cross that line because Jabril is a married man and he respects marriage. So he's not going to be that type of bitch where he's going to mess with a married man. But guess who is? We're going to find that out. Trust me, I'm going to get to that. But, um, so... We pretty much see that after Jabril tries to make his move and Christian pretty much rejects it, like, no, motherfucker, we just doing business. And that's where I draw the line. And then we see that Christian gets a call and he's like, all right, I'll be right over. So we're wondering who the hell Christian talking to. And he was talking to Derek. So him and Derek, so he's pretty much, you know, saying like, he's pretty much asking him, so is it over between you and Neil? He's like, look, I care deeply for Neil, but Neil is right now, it's not in a the, in the good headspace, and I don't need that negative energy in my life, so I'm over that. Then next thing you know, we see that, you know, Christian makes his move, and he, you know, pretty much, you know, gives Derek a kiss, and he's trying to see how far I can go. But then, you know, Derek's like, you still owe me lunch, though, so let's go. So they go out to eat. Now, this was the scene that completely rocked my world, and I know it rocked your world, too, so don't even try. But what ends up happening is that we see that Jabril comes over to Derek's place. The last place you would think Derek, um, Jabril would go, he went to Derek, and he pretty much said that, look, I apologize to you, Derek, you were right, Brandon is on drugs, and not only that, he not only, you know not only is he on drugs but then he also cheated on me again just like he did with Rob before we got married so they pretty so pretty much you know um he was saying that yeah so I'm pretty sure you really want to gloat right now and I'm pretty sure you want to you know I'm pretty sure you feel some kind of way so I know you want to make fun of me so you said so you really so so he's like come out come out with it tell me I deserve this shit it's my fault he's like yeah you deserve, you deserve it, but I don't like seeing anybody in pain, and I don't want you to hurt your girl, regardless of what, you, what I may come off. I really want the best for you. And then he was saying that, look, you know, we really did have something special, but Derek was like, no, what we had was a lie. He's like, no, it wasn't a lie. Parts of it was true. You know, I really did care about you. And then Derek's like, look, I'm not the same young boy you can play mind tricks on, and I'm not here for your bullshit, so... You know, I, I'm sorry that things are messed up for you, but, you know, you, you need to go on with it. But then Jabril kept being more and more persistent, like, look, maybe I made the wrong choice. Maybe I did make a wrong mistake. You know, maybe I should have chose the other option. But at that time, you know, I thought I was choosing the best choice, and now I'm thinking maybe I did it. And next thing you know, fucking Jabril and Derek starts kissing and shit and Derek gives in and I'm like oh shit I literally was like ooh I mean I literally was just ooing for a long time because I was so funny and the thing is I was even talking to a friend of mine um you know shout out to my boy um Brandon Latham you know who definitely follows me he um he actually hit me up while I was watching it and he said that your jaw is going to drop at that ending. And boy, was he right. Because I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this shit. What the hell just happened here? But yeah. But I can already see right now, this is going to cause some drama like crazy. Because now that Jabril and Derek are, messed up, are messing around, one, Jabril is going to feel like shit when he finds out that Brandon really didn't cheat on him. So now he is going to be the bad guy in the situation, not Brandon. Then, on top of it, you got fucking Neil and Christian 
in involving involved in this shit and you're gonna get you know, you pretty much gonna get fired from both ends with some from Neil and some Christian. So this is gonna be fucking crazy and I'm all here for it to see what happens next. But that's my review, y'all. If I miss anything, put it down in the comments. I'd love to talk to you about it. But subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to my channel. Click that bell so you can get notifications every time I drop a video. Like this video, share this video, and comment on this video. And I will be back with the next episode of Triangle. So until then, everybody, take care.